Hi, welcome to another video. Today I'm going to see if we can work out the resistance of a gate resistor required for a specific circuit. So this circuit in front of you, an amplifier beyond economical repair, I'm using a current mode PWM controller, runs on 15 to 17 volts, it's driving this FET via a 150 ohm resistor. What I'm hoping to do is give you some simple equations to find the value of your resistor. So this circuit is actually switching this LED, high power LED, on and off 85,000 times a second. So 85 kilohertz. It's connected to my power supply with some long leads. I'll go into that later. And my oscilloscope. Right, here's my schematic of what you've seen just now. So I've got 15 to 17 volts, high power LED with a couple of inline resistors. This is my UC3842 current mode PWM controller. This is my FET IRF840A. The quote, a total gate charge of 38 nanocoulombs. Don't let the nanocoulombs worry you. I'll go into that in a, in a second. Now I'm keeping this simple. The workings of a FET are far more complicated than I am going to describe today. But I'll give you the basics for hobbyists and how to work out the value of a gate resistor. So on my N-channel MOSFET, I've got the drain, the source and the gate. The LED is connected to the drain, so when the FET transistor is not turned on, this drain will sit up near 15 volts, minus the voltage drop across this LED. When the FET turns on, it will pull this drain down to ground, minus a few milliohms, which is the RDS on. So to turn on a FET, you basically have two parasitics. One capacitor connected to the gate and the source, and another connected to the gate and the drain. If you have a look at this top capacitor, it's usually much greater than this one. And because the value is greater, and the way it performs, I'll show you on the scope, they also refer to its effect as the Miller effect. But I'll show you on the scope, it'll make sense. So I said I'll keep the maths easy. Basics as a guide only. The real stuff is way more complicated and it can get more complicated. So if the total gate charge is measured in nanocoulombs and it is divided by a switching time in nanoseconds, the result will be in amps. So that's easy, isn't it? So if you've got a gate charge of 10 nanocoulombs and you want it to switch on in 100 nanoseconds, you need to supply 100 milliamps. Show you on a calculator. So 10 nanocoulombs divided by 100 nanoseconds equals 0.1 amp or 100 milliamps. So one coulomb is the charge in a circuit passing one amp over one second. So have a look on the internet. A coulomb is the amount of electrons passing in a circuit at one amp over one second. It's some like huge quintillion number. These parasitics, they're not external to the FET they're internal. So only when the drain starts conducting does the capacitance between the gate and source charge up. When the gate has reached a stable state, the capacitance between the gate and drain starts to charge. So capacitance between the gate and drain is also known as the Miller capacitance, but it behaves in the same manner described for inverting amplifiers. It will all make sense on the scope. So here's some more maths. Let's say you've got a gate charge of 20 nanocoulombs and you want to switch it on in 20 microseconds. I'll show you the long way first. So 20 nanocoulombs, so 0 0.123, that's all the millis. 1, 2, 3, that's all the micros. 1, 2, oh, that's 20 nanocoulombs. Divided by 20 microseconds, so point. O, 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 2, O, equals 0 0.001 amps. I said I'd keep the maths easy, so 20 nanocoulombs divided by, have a look over here, 20 microseconds is 20,000. So 20 nanocoulombs divided by 20,000 nanoseconds equals one milliamp. And finally down the bottom, 20 nanocoulombs, if you want it to switch on in 20 nanoseconds, 
20 divided by 20 is 1. So you need to supply 1 amp to get the switching speed of that time. Right, here's a look at my live scope view. The contrast between those colours at the moment isn't very clear. So what I'll do, I'll go to screen image, capture the screen and show you that way. This circuit's running at 84 kilohertz. My green signal, which there is no earth connected to that scope probe, hence the ripple. The green is the gate, the yellow is the LED. Right, so I've turned the yellow LED, which is the drain voltage, I've turned that signal off for a minute. This is my gate. So zero volts is down the bottom where my mouse is moving. The gate turns on, stays on for this duration, then turns off and stays off for this duration. And going back to my circuit drawing, when the gate turns on, it pulls the drain down to ground and the LED will be on. So when the LED is on, we will have no voltage on the drain other than a few milli or microvolts because of the RDS on resistance. I have to add that, otherwise people will shoot me down in flames. So it won't be absolute zero, but I'm calling it zero. When this is on, it's effectively zero. When the FET is off, this will rise up to the supply. But so I don't get shot down in flames, it will rise up to the supply minus the voltage drop across this diode, LED diode. So back to the scope. So this is the gate. Turns on, stays on for this time, turns off. Now if I turn the LED back on, and this is just the voltage we see on the drain of the FET. When it's at its highest peak, the FET is turned off. When it's down here at the bottom, the FET is turned on. Well, I've done a screen capture here, just so I can zoom in, make it bigger. So this green line, to remind you, the green line is the gate, the yellow line is the voltage on the drain. So your FET driver turns on and the voltage rises until it gets to the FET gate threshold. When it reaches the gate threshold, the drain starts to conduct. And at that time, the gate to source capacitance starts charging. So once the gate to source capacitor is fully charged, you can see we get this plateau the Miller plateau, the gate voltage levels off. All the time while the drive current starts charging the gate to drain capacitance. And remembering from the data sheet, the gate to drain capacitance is larger than the gate to source. It requires more charge. So you can see we've got a longer waiting period here. Once the gate to drain capacitance is fully charged, then the gate voltage continues to rise. Well, I've changed the scale to make it easy. We are now on 100 nanoseconds of division. The drain is starting to conduct and it's starting to pull that voltage down to ground. And since I had a nice 150 ohm on 15 volts, that's a nice tidy 100 milliamps. And we have got roughly 100 nanosecond switching time. You see it starts nearly at this left hand edge and stops down at this edge. So that switching time is roughly 100 nanoseconds. You can see once the gate to drain capacitance has finished charging, the gate then continues to charge up to whatever you put on the gate. And that takes significantly longer you can see. So starting from down here, we've got 100 nanoseconds here on this left hand corner. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, roughly 800 nanoseconds before the gate voltage has come up to its maximum. But we are concerned with this threshold down here. We've got a delay of 100 nanoseconds before we reach the threshold of the gate. And once we've reached the threshold of the gate, the transistor then switches on in its roughly 100 nanoseconds. And that was with 100 milliamps. 
and 150 ohm resistor. Now what's important about this gate threshold, although everything's happening here, it's important that you keep applying the gate voltage above this threshold for the FET to function correctly. So back to my transistor. So knowing I had a gate to source capacitance to fulfill nine nanocoulombs, I rounded up to 10. So 10 nanocoulombs divided by 100 nanoseconds equals 100 milliamps. I've now put in a 100 ohm resistor from the 150. So if we work that out, I've now got 19 volts on the drain, not 15. So 19 volts divided by 100 ohms equals 190 milliamps. So I've nearly doubled the current. And have a look at the scope, 50 nanoseconds of division. The drain is coming down to nothing in just over 50 nanoseconds. Just by reducing the 150 ohm down to 100, but turning the voltage up on the drain to 19 volts. But you can see we've still got this delay on the gate. If you actually look at where that drain starts conducting, it's roughly here. So we've got so 50 nanoseconds of division. We've got roughly 25 nanoseconds there, plus 50 nanoseconds there, and a small bit there. So really the answer to the value to your gate resistor is a big question because A, what FET transistor are you using? How quickly do you want it to switch on? But with the formula I've shown you, it puts you in the ballpark. So now I've shown you this plateau, also known as the Miller Plateau, you know what you're up against. But what I will leave you with is a video I did many years ago, or September 2017, where I was fixing an amplifier, the original part had the number of the FET engraved off, thank you to PV. I replaced an unknown FET with an Infineon FET. It had a large gate capacitance, a large total capacitance, and when I fitted it to the amplifier, the FETs were getting red hot in seconds, and I knew that because the fans were coming on. I kept quickly turning the amplifier off, before those transistors destroyed themselves. Now I explained in the very beginning of this video, the phenomenon which I describe in the video happened first in an amplifier on a quality PCB and I was then able to reproduce it on the bench. The phenomenon is gate loop ringing. So because of the parasitic capacitance within the FET or maybe parasitic inductance on your PCB, you can get into a situation where, as you're turning the transistor on, it will start to ring, or another word is like oscillate. And I was able to reproduce that phenomenon, gate loop ringing on a bench. That Infineon FET transistor was ringing at 2.3 MX, just in this view. But what was important with that Infineon FET is that ringing caused it not to switch off. It would stay turned on, even when the gate was pulled down to zero volts. Now, I'd heard of gate loop ringing, never experienced it in all the years of servicing electronic equipment, even back to the 80s. Probably because the equipment was designed with specific parts, so if a part went wrong, you would replace it with a genuine part. When you have parts and the numbers are engraved, you have to make do with what you've got. That's when I fitted a FET with a large total capacitance, a large gate capacitance into that position and then experienced this ringing, gate loop ringing. The phenomenon happened in an amplifier and I was able to reproduce it on the bench. So hopefully my basic maths has given you an idea of how to roughly work out what gate resistor you need but if you're prototyping something, you can find the resistor you need, connect it to your FET, connect it to a scope, and watch the results. If you need it to be faster, make it faster. But, and depending on the FET you have, if your PCB has long traces, long thin traces, you'll have a large amount of inductance. You could possibly have a large amount of stray capacitance. You could end up with gate loop ringing. To remedy gate loop ringing, 
you would take your gate resistor and increase its value. So you know, have a go at calculating the value of your own resistor and what switch on time you require. It's all easy if you keep the times in nanoseconds. If you're prototyping something, put an oscilloscope on your device. If you see it's ringing, you've got stray capacitance and stray inductance somewhere. And you can mitigate that by making the tracks shorter and wider. Little tip for you. So this video is quite lengthy, but and I've only touched the surface of field effect transistors and selecting a gate resistor. So hopefully you learned something. Give me a thumbs up if you liked it. Thanks for watching.